Welcome to The Great Humbling. I'm Dougal Tyne, co-founder of the Dog Mountain Project and a school called Home. In the spring of 2020, I began recording these conversations with the poet and recovering sustainability consultant Ed Gillespie. We call them The Great Humbling because this feels like a time of being humbled, brought down to earth and, if we're lucky, back into connection with land and soil and with each other. Thank you for listening. We're back. We're back, Ed. It's series five. We actually uh, made it. We're going we're gonna to try and do a series that doesn't take us a year and a half to do eight episodes this time, aren't we? Oh, I think like a fine wine, you can't rush good things. <laughs> you, need, you need the space for things to mature. But yes, uh, I think we're going to be uh, a little bit more disciplined this time around. How are you doing, sir? Uh, well, I'm not having the best of mornings. Um, <laughs> it, it's lovely to be back, but I stepped out onto a very wet deck this morning uh, and promptly went A over T uh, and landed flat on my face. Um, and I've got Tom Hirons staying uh, at the moment, the poet, and he, <laughs> he stuck his head out the kitchen window. He said, are you OK? And I was like, yeah, I really do need to clean this deck because it's got a healthy growth of algae on it. Um, and I was up half the night convincing myself that I had toxic squash syndrome because I played Russian roulette with some um, gourds from my allotment last night and I think I ate the wrong one. Um, so <laughs> I went down an NHS direct rabbit hole um, worrying that my hair was going to fall out, although actually my hair has already fallen out, so I needn't worry about that particular side effect. But it's very appropriate for Halloween to be having a kind of slightly horrible pumpkin experience uh, to start the day. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I I had no idea that pumpkins and squash were so dangerous. I, we've got about seventy of them in the shoe shop at the moment, so I'm going to be looking at them with new new eyes. I think you really should. Uh, I mean, the thing is, they're not dangerous as long as you don't eat the ones which are the ornamental ones, which haven't been selectively bred to have all of their lovely toxins uh, removed. Um, so apparently, the clue is like, if it tastes bitter, uh, don't eat it. Um, because your body has a good clue of going, hang on, this is probably not going to be good for me. Um, unfortunately, I'd mix mine in with potatoes and onions and courgette in a big sort of tray bake of roasted vegetables. So um, I think I probably didn't detect the bitterness. But everyone else I fed it to is fine. Uh, it's probably just me being hypersensitive. But um, yeah, <laughs> it was a very uh, Halloween start to the morning. <laughs> well, uh, continuing the Halloween theme, I'm sat up here in Alfie's bedroom because it seemed like the quietest place in the house to record this because we're waiting for a, a van load of Finnish removal men to arrive with uh, a piece of furniture that used to belong to Anna's grandmother that um, was it was meant to get here a month ago. And they forgot or thought we lived 100 miles away. It's a little unclear. <laughs> Um, and that time around, Anna had kind of organised her whole week so that she could um, uh, be there to receive the Finnish removal men and the piece of furniture and feed them the kind of food that Finnish men like and then uh, persuade them to move this huge old safe that we've had that's been in what was the shoe shop office and is now our guest room ever since we moved in. Uh, and I got the message from her because typically I was away the week when all of this was happening. I got this message from her on the morning when they should have arrived um, saying that uh, she just found out that they got the address wrong and they were taking it somewhere 100 miles away. And then 10 minutes later, I get a photograph and she was so cross about all of this. that It's like it's the superpower of being cross. She had single handedly moved this safe that we had been we'd convinced ourselves wow. weighed half a ton and was going to require at least three removal men to move it out of the bedroom where it had been stuck for a year and a half and into the shoe shop. So uh, they're coming. They're finally turning up today because Anna's mum got on the phone to them last week and uh, uh, told them the score. Uh, and so they've been on the overnight ferry. They're going to turn up and we're going to feed them my pumpkin soup, which I have uh, <laughs> made with a sort of Thai variant on, on pumpkin soup with coconut milk and various other spices. So now I'm concerned that 
I might be responsible for this. Could be the the Halloween where where Ed, Ed Gillespie. Uh, it nearly took a dark turn. I'm just imagining uh, you and Tom, <laughs> sometimes a wild god, Hirons, uh, and whoever else yeah. you were feeding last night. It could it could have been could have been a very dark Halloween. I'm hoping that we don't we don't do any damage to the finished removal men. No, I know. I'm impressed with Anna's anger as an energy, though. I didn't realise you were married to Dr. David Banner. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's just endless surprises, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what keeps we, a relationship fresh. We had we had this lovely guest on um Sunday night. So this this weekend we had Caroline Ross, a good friend of this podcast, and her friend Teresa Emmerich Camper. They came and stayed for a couple of nights because they were on tour in Sweden and did this amazing workshop show and tell where they were showing all of these um skins that they've tanned and furs and mm. they had a, a tanned toad which alfie was very impressed by uh, and also this stitched together coyote fur blanket and everyone like we were doing the thing where you pass things around the circle but that didn't work with the coyote fur blanket people didn't pass it they just sort of snuggled up under it until the person next to them went oi uh but My then, turn. <laughs> We had this lovely French guy who came like seven hours by train from the other side of Sweden to come for the afternoon for this event. And so we said, well, obviously, like, uh, you know, stay the night. Um, and we fed him. He, he brought lovely bread that he'd made and we fed him local cheese and uh, nice wine. And, and, and he told us that cheese is psychoactive. I, I always thought this was just a, an English folk superstition that you shouldn't eat cheese before bedtime. But he said no. Blue cheese, especially. Yeah. Yeah. That's what he said. He said blue Stilton um, and some of the kind of matured Italian hard cheeses, they have a kind of mild DMT um to them <laughs> so they really will give you very vivid <laughs> dreams so that is i'm completely uh, re rethinking my my attitude to these sort of old wives tales and discovering that i my inner modernist had dismissed the taboo on eating cheese yeah. at bedtime as just you know, english superstition but it turns out that there may be a uh, my... basis to it yeah, my six-year-old daughter is very into blue cheese. This might explain a lot uh, and her predilection for um, believing in the fairies in the garden. Um, it's actually to do with a healthy dose of Norfolk bin and blue. <sighs> oh, Ed, so here we are. We've survived the cheese. We've survived the pumpkin and the squash so far. We haven't killed any Finnish removal men yet. What else has been going on since we um, last did one of these? A lot of things. I also survived Vicar's knee, which I thought was ironic from a kind of great humbling perspective, um, which if anyone listening has suffered from this, I, I empathise, but um, it's intrapatellar bursitis, which is basically where well, you get a second kneecap. It's like the knee equivalent of tennis elbow. Um, you get a second kneecap below your original one, and it's incredibly painful. Uh, and I went to the doctor and he said, what do you do for a living? And I said, well, I don't work on my knees, if that's what you're implying. <laughs> um, but obviously it's called Vicar's Knee for, for for that reason. But yeah, it was very uncomfortable. Um, and I did think it was a sort of poetic payback and justice uh, for pontificating on and on about humbling uh, and then going down with Vicar's Knee myself. Ouch, that that doesn't sound very nice at all. No. Oh, anything anything else to report from the last uh, half year or it's more than that isn't it february was when we recorded the live show well yeah i mean there was some lovely feedback from the live show i think um it was extraordinary to have that experience of taking uh you know your work in terms of at work in the ruins to the stage and actually have that incredible conversation with rupert and charlotte um, on stage with us and um, someone gave me some lovely feedback after the event which just said you know I came along and found the evening to be disturbingly comforting you know it's a lonely old place to believe as I do that we're not going to be able to solution our way out of this uh, and that means what it means for us all those dear to us are not so and it, it just said it doesn't stop me wanting to try to do what I can in the area but all the time building community networks and I think it's that sort of thinking that's been um, rumbling along with me over the last six months is, you know, what what to do next. Um, uh, you know, and I've been um, doing my usual things. I've just I finally finished my 
eight year stint as a director of Greenpeace UK. Um, you know, they don't they don't allow you to do more than your two four year terms in case you go it turn into a crazy megalomaniac that they can't get rid of. Um, so I think there's a sort of healthy uh, compulsory retirement element to that. So it's been a bit of an end of an era for me because obviously being embedded in in a large activist organisation like that is is it both an honour um, and a responsibility. Um, so I've sort of moved on from that. And, and I did a fair amount of, of travel with my daughter over the summer, which was which was lovely. Um, took the train down to France and um, just been spending a, a lot of time parenting. <laughs> that sounds good, Ed. Yeah. I'm thinking back over what, what I've been up to since we were last doing this. Well, well, we went as a family to, uh, to Patmos, the island of the apocalypse, mm. with uh, Felix Marquardt and the Black Elephant Gang and uh, Martin Shaw and um, Liz Oldfield, who does the Sacred podcast, and Reed Wildermuth and this amazing collection of, um, of friends and strangers um and it was it was a very friendly very strange week and uh i lots of things have been sort of kind of bubbling or swirling around that so i'm sure that'll crop up somewhere along the way in the in the stories that um seem worth telling in the course of this series yeah that was that was a, that was an interesting trip and then we we came home and uh we've started doing live events in the shoe shop finally um, and we had, I mean, we had Sarah Thomas here on her trip around Europe talking about her book, the Raven's Nest. Um, and mm. then uh, oh, David Benjamin Blower, who is now our, our producer, nonetheless, for this podcast, but played the first concert in the, the shoe shop in Astavola uh, in July. And uh, David and Lydia Catterall, another friend of this podcast, were were visiting and then we've done the the thing this weekend with uh with caro and Teresa, um and there's just this sense of being able finally to sort of balance all of the online stuff that we do and that we'll keep doing around the school i mean we've got this regrowing a living culture series that's starting next week so we're, we're that's really still an important part of the work but with bringing people from our international network together with people who are our neighbours here in in this mm. small town in Sweden. So that's been a really gratifying part of the the last few months, definitely. I'm loving what you're doing with that kind of really living that notion of hospitality, uh, you, know, you know, with the school called home. And obviously it's an inherent element of that. But as you say, bringing cultural events and music and the kind of the virtual hosting of the long table, I think, you know, you're the embodiment of great hospitality, good sir. Well, that, that's very nice for you to say so. I think when you get here and visit us, you'll realise that really it's Anna who is the embodiment <laughs> of it, along with her superpower for uh, moving safe, swell, angry. And, and I'm, I'm, merely a, I'm merely a very good assistant. But uh, it's... It is great putting it into practice and it feels like stumbling along, putting one foot in front of the other, trying to figure out how to build these bridges between the different worlds that we're connected to. Mm. And there's something about starting small as well mm. that, you know, the first event we did, we had like, two of our neighbours and two people who'd been part of a thing we did with the university in Uppsala who came up for the evening uh, and us and our guest and that was fine like it's sort of the uh, like the open space rule whoever turns up are the right people um and then gradually we find our way more into the place and into the community and we get a different mix of people um showing up but it's just it's such a privilege to have have a space where we can convene people and make that space into something beautiful and welcoming so Ed, we have a tradition with this podcast, don't we? Which is we uh, we start the show by asking each other what we've been reading. So I want to know um, what's been on your bedside table and uh, accompanying you uh, through the um, the darkening evenings of uh, deepening autumn. What what are you reading at the moment? It's quite a pile since we last spoke, so I've obviously not <laughs> I picked out a couple of highlights. I've just finished. Uh... 
your old buddy i mean i don't know dougie strang but i know you do from days of yore um in in the early period of the dark mountain era and i've just read dougie's the bone cave um which i really enjoyed which is a sort of journey of myth and memory um through the highlands of scotland particularly the west coast and the far northwest corner of scotland um and it's it's just a month long walk he did exploring the connections and the roots of some of the old folkloric stories of the highlands um and also inevitably tracking you know the changing patterns of of ownership and the way that those have impacted upon the notion of community and the connection to the land uh and the highland clearances obviously being the most obvious but also the you know the the continued dominance of these big highland estates and the exclusion of people um from a land and a living landscape uh, stalked by you know the the spirits of wolves long gone um you know shape-shifting deer women uh and the name of the scottish witch spirit that i can't pronounce that you might have to help me with Dougal, because i think it's the kaliak Kaliak, yeah, Kaliak, Kaliak, something like that. I mean, I I went on to Google this morning and listened to five different, like, how to pronounce Kaliak. <laughs> it was like five different ways, so I got no closer uh, to actually finding what the appropriate one was. So let's just go with Kaliak. But um, it's a really beautiful book. I I found it like gently moving, and and Dougie keeps coming back to this repeated question, which is. You know, what does ownership of land mean? You know, does it have any real meaning? And more importantly, what you know, what does that have to do with love, if anything? Um, and I think it's a really profound question, you know, particularly when we're discussing right to roam questions uh, and, and the returning of, of land to communities who probably do wish to love it and respect it and care for it and nurture it in a way that perhaps these large scale owners n- can't possibly do practically so i really enjoyed that i found i found dougie's book um a, a real real pleasure and a delight and a real really powerful provocation to mm. read as you're saying that it's making me think of uh one of the the members of our long table network around the school ayaka fuji who's a young woman in um malaysia who is part of a project where they have taken over something that's been a palm oil plantation so you've got something that started off as a really rich forest that's then been devastated by this exploitative agriculture and that they're now working to bring back to life through agroforestry and she was speaking about this on one of our calls a while back and she came out with this line that has kept echoing with me where she's like We've realised that the land is dreaming of being forest and the people are dreaming of being community. And that sense that this might be the same journey is the, the thing that I hear calling in what you're talking about from, from Doogie's book. I'm really looking forward to, to reading the book. I haven't read it yet, but I also have this sense, this kind of great excitement at the moment of seeing... This gang of Dark Mountain authors, you know, people who really put a lot of heart and soul into Dark Mountain over its first 10 years or more, coming out and kind of taking to the page and the stage and kind of coming out in full voice. Because I think in the early years, I was saying this to Paul the other day, I don't don't know how it felt to him, but uh, it looked often like If you wanted to point to where are examples of the kind of writing that Dark Mountain is speaking for, this uncivilised writing we spoke about in the manifesto. Mm. And you basically had, you know, the novels of Paul Kingsnorth and then maybe Gregory Normanton, for example. So there were one or two other writers who were kind of close to the project. But there's there's been some kind of arc of maturation now where kind of 15 Mm. years down the line, it's like, you know... Maybe it takes 15 years before you have something that's ready to drink. Uh, that might that might be the whiskey talking, but uh, but there, there there is kind of seriously, you know, Doogie's um, the Bone Cave and his wife M Strang, who was a poetry editor for Dark Mountain for a number of years, who her first novel Quinn came out earlier this year. Nick Hunt, who's co-director of Dark Mountain, his first novel Red Smoking Mirror. 
Caroline Ross, we already mentioned her book Found and Ground, which is about all of the the techniques of the kind of um, a pink, wild pigment making that she does, but also the writing that she's doing on her substack, Uncivil Savant. And then Charlotte Ducan's book After Ithaca, and uh, she's just launched a substack called The Red Tent as well. And it's just like this kind of chorus of uh, or polyphony of voices of people who were right at the heart of Dark Mountain during those kind of early and mid years who are now, um, I think, you know, getting the attention that they deserve, which is uh, fantastic. Maybe there's also something about the, the world catching up with uh, the things that we were seeing coming over the horizon in those early years of Dark Mountain as well. Exactly. Coming up, speaking of coming over the horizon, I remember you telling me about how Dougie used to dress up as a wolf and lurk along the periphery uh, <laughs> of, of Dark Mountain events in the countryside. And uh, yeah, anyone who's prepared to play with that wonderful perception uh, of landscape uh, in that mischievous way uh, is it's going to get my attention. So anything else that's been on your bookshelves or it's been um, keeping you up late at night reading? Well, then a couple of, I guess, a couple of dystopian ones. You know, I mean, I like to sort of mix things up. I read what is a brilliant satirical novel um, by Ned Bowman, uh, which is Venomous Lump Sucker, uh, which you'll appreciate, Dougal, because it's sort of, it's set all over the world, but it's actually sort of focused on the Baltic. Um, and it's about the world's most intelligent fish. Uh, but it's set in a sort of near future in which, you know, the world has unravelled. Um, it's very much in a sort of ruinous state. Um, and what Ned has brilliantly done is taken sort of the idea of carbon credits and extended that to its sort of very unnatural conclusion of extinction credits, which allows large corporates to carry on um, wreaking the devastation that they do. But as long as they buy up enough extinction credits for the species, they annihilate in the process. Um, and it's it's rare in those books in the fact that it's laugh out loud funny um it's so brilliantly done uh, and well researched you know there there's a there's a rigor to it um i think he spends years on his books but you know it's dark it's funny it's absolutely on point in terms of spiking some of the the inherent madness of extended modernity if you take it to the nth degree um whilst also offering you know chinks of insight as to where the real action might lie uh, in that type of context so I, I thoroughly enjoyed that and then closer to home for me was uh, John Lanchester's The Wall which um, is set in uh, a near future Britain where a, a bit like Cormac McCarthy's The Road you know there's been this sort of unspecified event or they refer to it in The Wall as The Change and um, which is clearly some kind of climatic event, which has led to a realignment of the coastline, obviously a changing of sea levels, um, and the construction of an enormous concrete wall around the entire coast of uh, Britain, um, which is then manned by you know young people on a sort of national service type basis for a two-year stint. Everyone has to do it, um, basically to shoot or, or fight off what they call the others. Um, who are, are clearly displaced uh, migrants and people who are trying to get in to Fortress Britain. Um, it's pretty miserable, as to be said, but um, weirdly plausible, you know, because it's sort of set in a sort of Brexiteery insularity, you know, um, othering of foreigners, everyone subsisting on turnips um, within the wall, but, you know, in, in fear and hatred of what lies beyond. Um, and and also a kind of intergenerational tension with the kind of, you know, a privileged and guilty uh, older generation who are responsible uh, for not addressing the causes of the change. And then this younger generation who are being brought up um, essentially to man and fight the barricades. Um, so it's not, I wouldn't say it's as sophisticated as Ned Bowman, but um, as, as a kind of a, a, a credible warning shot across the bows. Um, there's a lot of resonance. It was funny when you mentioned that to me, because uh, I'd been reading a couple of essays that John Lanchester wrote a few years back about Game of Thrones. And I was like, oh, I wonder <laughs> where, whether that's part of how he ended up writing about 
the wall. You know nothing, John Lanchester. <laughs> <laughs> well, I've been reading a, uh, another dystopian novel called The Wall from 1963 by the Austrian novelist Marlon Haushofer. And she wrote this, wow. this novel, which is about this woman who's visiting her her brother's hunting lodge and her brother and his wife kind of go off for the evening to the nearby town and she wakes up the next morning and they haven't come back and she discovers that this invisible wall has kind of appeared around this section of the mountains where she is and it seems like everyone on the everything on the outside of the wall has died and it's basically her diary over the next three years of her being changed by this isolation and kind of r rapid, radical simplification of her life and concerns and the animals that she's living alongside. So, yeah, the the walls, um, the walls are many. But um, just to sort of land up the reading bit for and to lighten things up a bit. I mean, you said that actually the venomous lump sucker was laugh out loud funny. Also laugh out loud funny, uh, less dystopian. Um, Alfie and I have rediscovered, or in his case, discovered, in my case, rediscovered, The Bagthorpe Saga by Helen Creswell. These, there's 10 <coughs> novels. There's only two of them that are still in print, but we're sort of collecting all of the out of print ones. Just absolutely hilarious stories about this, this big, crazy, English eccentric family where the only, the only sane one is the um, little boy Jack and his dog, zero and all of the rest of them are convinced that they're geniuses and i really rarely read something which provokes so much general laughter in the in the whole family so that that's my my recommendation especially if you have the excuse of having like uh kids of an age to to read it to but even if you don't if you if you just want something to to make you laugh a lot my memory of it is very hazy but um I, I did note it was set in in a fictional near a fictional market town of Asian, which sounds suspiciously close to Aylsham, which is just up the road from me in Norfolk. So, uh, uh, yes, it feels it feels quite close to home. So, all right, Ed, what do we really want to talk about in this series? You know, we've been doing the Great Humbling now for what three and a half years, and obviously, plenty of things have happened in the world in that time there's a lot of things that we've found ourselves talking about in these conversations but i'm curious as we head into series season five you know what are we seeing in the world and in the work that we're doing and in the stuff that's calling to us um what feels like it matters now what should we be talking about over the weeks and months ahead mm. yeah and, and as i said earlier i think that's the, the question that we're we're all carrying um, I I was in Bristol recently for what they call the Blue Earth Summit, which was an interesting sort of aggregation of, you know, some of the usual sort of corporate suspects, but also a lot of campaigners and activists and, and community folk and people doing what I would call, you know, some of the novel and interesting projects. And it was it was very much one of those sort of big tent style events where you're going, ah, this is an unusual mix of people. Um, but I had dinner with John Elkington, you know, sort of godfather of sustainability that night. And he was talking very powerfully about, you know, the the cycles of violence that uh, are now starting to manifest that he had been concerned about for some time. I think when you have that sort of long view uh, that John has, you can see this stuff coming around and, and, and perhaps from my more junior perspective of only half a century on the planet and his, you know, 25 year head start uh, on our thinking, perhaps he could see that coming more readily the, than we might have done. But in answer to your direct question, um, in terms of where I find myself, I mean, it's very weird because I get the invitations and, and get the honour um, and privilege of, of taking the stage in front of some interesting audiences um, but I'm struggling with some of the the positioning now of what I say. You know, I don't want to sort of go into the the sort of doom territory. So I'm finding myself in that very rigorous, authentic sort of truth-telling mode. 
um, where there isn't always a, a sugar to the pill um, or, you know, a, a, a sucker to the punch. It's it's quite difficult sort of territory. Um, uh, I mean, I've been invited to speak to some insurance people in, in, in a few weeks. And these are the these are the risk people, uh, you know, who are supposed to be managing risks for large organisations. You know, and the real truth, as we know, is it's like there's been this chronic systemic failure to get their heads around what those risks that we're all facing now mean in in any way shape or form that's meaningful and so it's hard not to be quite brusque with an audience like that saying you know this is a chronic systemic failure but also the empathic note comes from the fact that i feel the constraints that they operate within in terms of a system which doesn't allow them to manage those risks in the right way because it would be existential for the organization for them to actually do so so they're sort of hogtied by their you know fiduciary and shareholder responsibilities within the system they can't get the ear of their board in order to take those things seriously and and i see this sort of this entrapment motif like um repeated in another context as well i spoke at a big climate change summit in Bucharest um, a week or so ago, where, you know, that sort of Eastern European mentality, where um, after years of subjugation, you know, in the case of Romania, underneath a, a Ceausescu regime, and then this sort of capitalist bounce back and, and membership of the European Union, and, and now obviously also very concerned about climate impacts. And it was fascinating to be on the other side of Europe, you know, which felt a long way away, uh, particularly when you go there by train and it takes you 48 hours to get there. But a, a real sense that I was seeing things from the other side of the continent, you know, in that Asiatic transition zone uh, where the view is 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 different to the one that we have um, in the sort of northwestern corner of Europe. And I didn't want to sort of not piss all over their parade, but you know, they they were still in the kind of like, you know, optimism solutions for climate change uh type of mindset and i was asked to talk about the future of activism well they said future of climate action and i rather mischievously changed it to the future of climate activism so like we're all activists now in some way shape or form and i said you know you're going to have to confront the five p's which is you know you have to confront power we really have to um stand up to that power we have to engage with the politics. Uh, we have to bring the people in through things like citizens' assemblies um, and very much have that community inclusion. Uh, we need all of the powers of persuasion at our disposal, but also underpinning all of that is the ongoing necessity of protest, which keeps the pressure on. But I'm st I am still find myself casting about for what is the most the most effective way I can communicate my concern in a way that it continues to land with those audiences. Mm. Yeah, I mean, we were having a similar conversation here last week because we had Sam Conniff, another friend of the show, mm. visiting for a, a couple of nights and, you know, he does Be More Pirate and The Uncertainty Experts. And you know, we were kind of talking about the same things, about what can you say to people who are working on the inside of existing organizations, companies, institutions. And part of it is just, you know, the cost of really taking this stuff seriously is an existential cost for the organization, for the institution. And it's, you know, finding the place of intervention when that's the case is not not straightforward. I've been I've been thinking about this in recent weeks because obviously, you know, I've been I've spent a lot of time this year taking at work in the ruins, out into the world and, you know, getting lots of different questions in response to the book. And a lot of what I talk about, you know, in, in the book, I'm speaking for the small path, the branching paths where you're turning aside from uh, the the big road that was meant to lead to the future. And I do believe in the kind of the human scale, the being the um, the 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 rats running around under the feet of the dinosaurs, kind of um, as the place to focus the the attention and the energy. 
But what came into focus for me, partly from talking to Nate Hagens, I met up with Nate when he was in Stockholm in September, and then I went on his podcast, which feels sort of like a twin to ours, because his is called The Great Simplification. It feels like we're describing the same thing. Um, But that conversation set me thinking, in particular, about this phrase that I've used a lot that comes from Federico Campagna, the Italian philosopher, where he's talking about making good ruins. Mm. And he's like, you know, sometimes you're born into the ending of a world. This is a thing that happens. The way that you tell is that the future doesn't work anymore. It no longer sounds convincing when people try to extend the narrative that you're inside. And he says, if that's your discernment about what's called for, then there are two things to do, two things to try. First is... Stop worrying so much about making sense according to the logic of the world that is ending. And the second is making good ruins. So making things that are not complete, finished. They're not plans and designs that you've mapped out and implemented. They're more about kind of releasing resources from the thing that you're inside that might turn out to be useful in ways that you can't fully foresee in what is going to come after. And... In the last few weeks, after kind of talking about that all year, it began to take on a different note to me. It began to be something that I could almost see as a strategy. So it's like, if you look out at the world and at the existing system, there are actually pockets and pools of resources that, for one reason or another, are not under an obligation to pretend to make sense according to the logic of the world that is ending. And I've always talked about sort of arts organisations and those of us who get to work within the field of culture as having an opportunity with this because the artist has a sort of special licence to do things that don't make sense according to economic logic within the world of modernity. And so lots of the smaller arts organisations that I've worked with have had this quality of being a sort of portal where they've got a door on one side that opens into existing systems and can access those kind of, you know, small scale amounts of funding, but can can exist and can be legible within the world as it exists just now, whilst doing things that are about creating an opening into the unknown world that lies ahead, into the, you know, what Vanessa Machado de Oliveira calls the presently unimaginable futures. But what struck me now is actually there might be, you know, th- there are, there are private foundations, there are you know, high net worth individuals, whatever it is, people who are sitting with non-trivial amounts of resources within this kind of semi-fictional game of the economy as we know it. Um, I say semi-fictional because on the one hand, these are kind of constructs and on the other hand, they have consequences and they shape the world and things would fall apart if you just took them all away overnight. Um, but where it might be possible to find those people, to get into dialogue with them, to try and build the bridges by which those resources contribute to the creating, you know, the making good ruins, the creating conditions of possibility for things to turn out less badly than we mostly fear they're going to in the the decades and the generations ahead. And so you know, then I'm like starting to make this kind of back of an envelope list of, well, what would be the different strands of work that you would encourage those organisations to be funding? Mm. It's like, well, OK, so for example, Richard Smith, the former editor of the British Medical Journal, wrote an in-depth review of my book in the BMJ. And at the end of it, he uh, takes the sort of four tasks for a time of endings from the end of the book, the kind of salvage the good stuff we have a chance of taking with us, mourn the good stuff that we're not going to get to take with us, Mm. notice the stuff that was never as good as we told each other it was, and looked for the dropped threads from (laughs) earlier in the story, the things that have been marginalised or below the radar that it's time to weave back in because they might make all the difference. And he basically went through the field of medicine and created his own sort of initial back of an envelope list of what things, what skills, technologies, practices belonged in each of those four categories. So then I'm like, well, okay, so one of the pieces of work would be kind of barefoot doctors 2.0, like getting somebody like Richard Smith and other people within the the, yeah. the field of medicine together to look at uh, what can we, what do we want to maximise the chance of getting to bring with us? 
what kind of training programs could we create that could be useful right now in lots of places in the world that are, you know, further into this unevenly distributed collapse and unfolding, but also stuff that it would be good to have everywhere in terms of skills and practices and knowledge for uncertain futures. So that's just like one one thread within this. But that's so that's kind of I I'm I'm starting to find myself slightly to my surprise beginning to have some answers or at least suggestions for how things that are kind of bigger players or structures within existing systems might be able to contribute to the kind of stuff that I was writing about in the book in a way that I couldn't necessarily see when I was writing it. But Ed, I mean, you brought me this image of ruins that maybe I has a has some medicine for us in relation to all of this. Yeah, and it's it's one of those images that uh, has been with me for many years. But you know how the the relevance of an image can suddenly break through. Um, I guess from the familiarity, because it's from a place called Cove Hythe, which is down on the Suffolk coast, about um, fifteen miles from where I live. And it's always the spot that we go to. It's our kind of go-to beach walk because it's very wild. It's a sort of crumbling um, sand cliff. But the striking thing is, is is the village church of St Andrews in Cove Hythe because what you've got is the, the remains of a very large church, um, a, a kind of 13th or 14th century church, which reflected the sort of mercantile success of that coastline at the time um, in the building of a very grand um, place of worship. Um, and then with the changing fortunes of the area, um, as harbours silted up and erosion removed places like Dunwich, which had been one of the major trading ports, um, I guess, you know, um, resources became leaner uh, and, and more more challenging. And... The congregation actually then uh, applied to the bishop to say uh, we would like to to downscale the church, you know. And so, effectively, what they did was they dismantled, but partly some of your your four principles of of making good ruins strategy. They got permission to dismantle the outer church or or most of it, um, and then rebuild a much smaller, more practical, uh, fit for purpose uh, building within those those remaining walls so you have these big arched windows and basically a a stone edifice on the outside and then a very neat little thatched building uh inside and i i've walked past this place dozens of times over the years but in in light of our conversations i suddenly had this moment i'm going ah well this is this is what making good ruins really looks like this is almost like uh, a stark visual metaphor for degrowth this is what what it looks like to actually take the best of what you had before and do it respectfully uh, and then reinvent it in a way which is more useful and makes more sense for where you find yourselves now. Um, and, it, and it was incredibly powerful. And you sent me those photographs and what you couldn't have known was that I had been kind of carrying this image of the ruined church really all my all my adult life. I, 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 it sent me back to this poem that I wrote when I was 19 the uh where the the closing lines of it are like let the churches lie in ruins all things crumble by and by until some stranger seeking a place of refuge from the human race stumbles on the wordless grace of altars under autumn skies and then i remembered that mm. you know, actually you know in connection to some of the same networks that doogie strang and others in scotland who were connected to dark mountain were involved in i was approached you know, quite a while back now, it must have been around 2016, about the idea of doing something in these amazing, like, mad modernist ruins on the you know the banks of the Clyde, um, northwest of Glasgow, where the Catholic Church built this seminary in the 60s that was sort of abandoned within 20 years, and no one can figure out what to do with it because it's this extraordinary uh, piece of modernist architecture, but completely impractical. And so the forest is gradually creeping its way in. But there were these folks who were doing some kind of uh, installations and art events in those ruins. Uh, and that kind of really lit my imagination then, this idea of you know, what kind of encounters become possible 
among the ruins, both the ruins of modernity, but also the ruins of our religious traditions in the institutional forms that they've had. And into the middle of all of that came this review of the book um, by John Foster for the Greenhouse Think Tank, where he wrote this very interesting, a very enthusiastic review of at work in the ruins. He's like, he's left one thing out. He's left out the metaphysics. And that arrived on a Monday morning of the week where on the, the Friday I was going to be setting off to the Black Elephant Gathering in Patmos, which was literally called Meta Plus Physics. So I feel like the other side of what's been unfolding in my work since we were last having one of these conversations, since we did the live show in February, uh, on the one side, there's this kind of call to, you know, actually step up and try and make some suggestions for what kind of large scale interventions might contribute to the the unfolding of the small path. And on the other side, there's this you know, okay, what is the what is the metaphysics? What is it that becomes you know, possible within the ruins of our religious traditions? And what does that have to contribute to um, the work that I was saying is called for in the book? And it feels like those are the two, uh, two fairly massive things that are kind of sitting on my plate as we come into this series. But also, I, when we were talking about, you know, starting a new series, I think something that was resonating for both of us was this idea of centering images of the mm. way in which you can get that kind of almost like the, the sort of domino effect of connections there or the mycelium of connections that sprung from you dropping I'm mixing my metaphors terribly here you dropping the pebble in the pond of sending me those photographs of you at Cove Hyde with the kind of this humble church inside the grand ruin of the medieval church um, and I, maybe leaning into trusting images and the imaginal as what you know, what picks up where the grand solutionist projects of modernity fail us. Maybe that's part yeah. of where we want to go this time around with, with the great humbling. And you left me with that quote, uh, which I think you put on your substack from China Meville, the kind of celebrated... Um, science fiction writer because he's actually wrote, wrote a short story called Cove Highs, didn't he? And you and you had that wonderful quote um, from his piece where it goes, "He stopped her by the roofless ruin of the church, pointed and heard her gasp, and she stared while moonlight got past the clouds to the hold and broken walls onto a low, newer church inside the nave of the old." And I'd I I never knew that he'd written a piece, you know, that was a set in Cove Hive. And also um, it's very weird because I knew China way back in the day when we were both preparing to go and do our years volunteering work abroad. And he was off to Egypt and I was off to Jamaica, but um, I, I knew him before he was uh, celebrated and famous. Um, and, and that the st short story Cove Hive is full of some pretty bizarre imagery. I mean, again, which I, I think is quite haunting um, we'll put a link perhaps in the show notes to the piece, which was written in The Guardian over a decade ago. Uh, but it is all about abandoned or destroyed oil rigs re-emerging from the sea, uh, you know, marching in these sort of hydraulic automatons out of the water to come back and either feed or lay eggs on the land in order to hatch out lots of other little oil rigs, which is such a kind of metaphor um uh to which we might be uh alluding it's the undead ruins of industrial modernity isn't it it's extraordinary it's an extraordinary story absolutely yeah and it, yeah actually the last line of of that short story is also really relevant you know um but he he, he looks back in the direction of the graveyard and of saint andrew's stubby hall where services continued within the medieval carapace, remains of a grander church fallen apart to time and the civil war and to economics, fallen ultimately with permission. And I thought, oh, yeah, that's that's also um, very uh, relevant for for what we're talking about. Do you know? Maybe that's what we're looking for. Maybe that's what the great humbling is really about: is yeah. permission to fall. Exactly. And I think, you know, you then, once we'd shared that image and you'd included that in your writing, I know you got deluged with a whole bunch of 
uh, images of other ships, uh, or other churches rather, with uh, boats as roofs. Yeah, I had this. Um, I had this memory of uh, a uh, story I'd heard a long time ago about a church that uh, where the roof had been made from. You know, a decommissioned ship that had sort of see its sailing days were done and it was turned upside down and kind of put on um, pillars and turned into a church roof. And I've no, I sort of went looking to try and like, work out how this would even be possible in terms of the carpentry. But in the process, although I didn't find it, I was reminded that, you know, the word for the central part of a church is nave, which literally comes from the Latin word the ship. And then I was like, well, maybe that's what happens in the ruins of the religious traditions is that we remember that, you know, these things were actually you know, vessels to go out onto deep waters rather than static mm. um, places of trying to hold on to a past that is slipping away from us. And uh, yeah, and then people send, started sending me these these images, you're right, of uh, you know, churches that looked like ships or made out of ships or whatever. Well, I know, and, and and with that image, I was then in Lincoln Cathedral the following week, I think, uh, and in the cloisters there, it's really unusual because the cloisters there have wooden ceilings. Um, they were built in 1296, uh, but they are exactly like the hulls of uptown boats. Uh, and it, that brought to mind to me the quote, you know, from John Shedd, like you were saying, that these, sh- these churches were vessels to sail out into deeper waters. Like a ship in a harbour is safe, but that's not what ships are built for. Uh, they're supposed to go out into the deeper and wilder waters. And I think if we wanted to conclude on a note that sort of makes another echoing sense from something I was working on actually about five years ago, when I when XR and Extinction Rebellion first sort of broke into the consciousness in 2018, and I was trying to put together a climate change poetry anthology as a fundraiser for xr and i you know i did all the work and then destroyed myself on the obtaining of poetry rights uh, and it didn't actually happen but i was really struck i went back to it the other week uh, and for some reason i'd included well i know why i'd included this quote i can't quite remember where i'd got it from but it's from dh lawrence um lady chatterley's lover uh, and it basically reads art is essentially a tragic age so we refuse to take it tragically. The cataclysm has happened. We are among the ruins. We start to build up new little habitats to have new little hopes. It is rather hard work. There is now no smooth road into the future, but we go round or scramble over the obstacles. We've got to live, no matter how many skies have fallen. And it's prophetic, isn't it? To think of Lawrence writing that almost a hundred years ago in you know in a world where the kind of the innocence of modernity had been broken on the horrors of the first world war and you know mm-hmm. as we look around at there is no no end of horror um there's no end of ruins being made as we're sitting here you know ourselves in these you know, quite sheltered and um fortunate positions trying to puzzle through all of this together but just to be accompanied by those words and that sort of prophetic vision of the the building up the new little habitats in a time when there's no smooth road into the future and that's still the work that's here for us to do starting from where we find ourselves i'm really looking forward to to continuing this journey together Ed over the, the months ahead. Me too. Thank you for listening to The Great Humbling. We're grateful for all the messages we get from listeners and the other ways you support us sharing these episodes, spreading the word and rating them on iTunes and elsewhere. To explore further along the paths we walk in these conversations, subscribe to my Substack, Writing Home and check out the online series at a school called home. You can also find us on Facebook as The Great Humbling, and Ed is at Frucool on the platform formerly known as Twitter. The Great Humbling is produced by David Benjamin Blower, and the title music is I Recall by Blue Dot Sessions. (laughs) ¶¶